First off, I would like to uh, have a quick moment of silence for uh, a friend of ours in the industry, Paul Cripps, who uh, many of you know passed away over the weekend. He was the uh, director of the Plymouth County Convention and Business Bureau for the last uh, 20 years. Just have a moment of silence. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. I'm Chris Cooney. It's my pleasure to welcome you here to this very special Good Morning Metro South brunch edition. It's hosted uh, here at Southeastern, Mass uh, Southeastern Technical Institute uh, by our friends and also supported by the Old Colony Illness Services, OCBS. I also want to thank Phil Carver and UMass Boston. They are our season sponsor for our Legislative Affairs Division. And I also want to uh, give a nice round of applause for the STI staff here, Rhonda and Phil Cameron. We're delighted to have uh, such a wonderful facility in our region, both Southeastern Technical Institute and Southeastern Vocational Technical High School, which are co-located here, are extraordinary resources. Uh, preparing students for productive careers in traditional and emerging industries, both. We're going to hear more from uh, them and OCES in a few moments. Uh, this, the idea of this meeting is to hear from informed speakers about issues of regional importance. The goal is to come away with a better understanding more resources and a stronger network, leading us to better solutions for our regional economy. We are honored to have with us today as our panelists and guests, Andre LaRoe, Susan Conley, and Scott Hamway. Let's have a round of applause for them. We're equally delighted to have uh, with us a very, guest, a very special guest speaker, the Mayor of Rockton, Bill Carpenter. A round of applause. In addition, we have very many uh, both elected and selected officials with us. I'm going to attempt to capture all those that walked in. If I miss you, please let me know. I'll announce you later in the program. We have uh, with us uh, State Representatives Claire Cronin and Jerry Cassidy. We understand that the bar is on the way. In addition, from the city of Rockton uh, in county, we have John Buckley from the County Register of Deeds. We're a counselor from Rock City, Rockin. And we'll ask you to hold your applause until the end. <laughs> city uh, Councilor uh, Ward 4, Susan DeCastro, City Council Ward 5, Ann Beauregard. In addition, Southeast Regional Vocational Technical uh, School Committee, we have the Chairman, Steve uh, Uden. In addition, we have Tony Branch, Robin Zoll, Mark Lindy, and Michael Petrowski. Uh, Town of Bridgewater uh, is Michael Dunton. In addition, we have a town administrator from the town of Avon, Frank Lyman, and the assistant town administrator, Lisa Green. Uh, from Easton, we have Connor Reed, Dottie Florinetti, she's the chairman of the Board of Selectmen, uh, Craig Barber, Ber Berber, Barber uh, from the Board of Selectmen, and Stephanie Danielson, also from Easton, uh, the director of planning and economic development. We're delighted to have from the town of Avon, uh, town administrator Greg Enos. Uh, town of Stoughton, we have Robin uh, Luke Sian, and from Mass Development, uh, Marian LaFrias and uh, Maria Morasco from MOBD. And at the hand of another list here, uh, that's it. So, it's now my pleasure to introduce uh, Ray Ledoux, former chair of the chamber and uh, current chair of the Government Affairs Division. He is also the administrator for the Rockland Area Transit Authority. Uh, he is a person who provides leadership through many avenues, sometimes obvious, like today, and seeing this program, sometimes in a more subtle way, like recently donating a bad bus to uh, the mass hire, which used to be called the uh, Rock and Roll Force Investment Board, to retrofit it uh, to become a mobile training unit for both employers and employees to benefit. And uh, as, it, as it turns out, it's in the bay just up the hallway here being uh, finished uh, for use uh, in the region, and uh, we're so delighted in that. Uh, please join me in uh, a special round of applause for our MC. I'm going to mention one more thing. He was on the front page of the newspaper recently for a good reason. Uh, the headline was, We Bid Adieu to Mr. Ledoux. And, uh, he has announced his retirement after 37 years, started driving a bus when he was in college, and uh, is now retiring. And uh, we wish him uh, the very best. Uh, but we're delighted that he's here today at MC. So please join me in a nice round of applause for him. Yeah.
Chris, and uh, one of my favorite money uh, Python lines is, I'm not retired yet. So, uh, or they, they phrased it a little bit differently. But thank you, Chris, and thank you, everyone, for being here today. Uh, and uh, I'd also like to announce that Frank Lanham has not really moved to A1 just recently, uh, but he's still in Whitman, and, uh, and uh, Greg Enos, who's just joined uh, Whitman just recently in the last year. We welcome you, uh, Greg, uh, to this event as well. So uh, a couple of announcements here is um, one of the things, the Chamber, which has been a business leader and accredited for so many years, is recognized in so many different ways. And one of the recent recognitions is that the Chamber was recently, yet again, recognized as a regional economic development agency called, we call that REDO. And what happens is the Chamber receives uh, funding to provide programs like this, research and studies. And recently, uh, Chris was with uh, the Senate President Spilka, uh, the Lieutenant Governor, uh, and the newly announced uh, Director or uh, Secretary of Economic Affairs, where Chris was uh, awarded a $106,000 grant to continue the redo efforts. So Chris, uh, if we can give Chris and the staff a round of applause for that. <laughs> so what redo has helped accomplish is it has funded studies like whether the city of Rockland should entertain the uh, idea of buying the desalinization plant, looking at the region for advancing biotech opportunities, and I know you'll hear more about that in the upcoming year, taking a look at the CSX freight yards, which is about 35 acres uh, in the center of the city of Rockland, and looking to see if there could be a readaptive use for that, is taking a look at the Rockland fairgrounds, to see if there could be other uses for that, whether retail, shopping, housing, or a casino. Water and sewer uh, discussion issues in terms of uh, the needs for expansion and concepts for partnerships, and programs like this uh, that we'll focus today on housing. In the Commonwealth, Governor Baker, during his uh, traveling debate series, as well as the State of the State Address, as well as other announcements, has talked about the challenge of housing here in the Commonwealth. And for the Commonwealth to be competitive to keep its young workforce here and its older, aging citizens here in the Commonwealth from leaving the state, has talked about housing as one of the principal cha challenges that he would like to tackle in his administration in the upcoming four years. He's identified a need to create 135,000 housing units uh, through the year 2025 a fairly aggressive plan. There is, uh, from what we understand, a bill called uh, House uh, 4290 uh, that is, uh, has been filed, may be rediscussed again, and is similar to other bills related to housing. Now this is the part of the program where there's some audience uh, participation. So I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. How many, and keep your hand raised, how many of you have an adult child living in your household at this time? Okay, keep your hand raised, okay? How many of you have a parent living with you in either an in-law setup? Okay. You can raise two hands if you feel like a little bit extra exercise. Okay. How many of you have a parent who's thinking of downsizing or moving south to lower costs? Keep your hands up if you raise the other time. How many of you know a commuter or a friend who commutes into Boston and takes that long commute and wishes that they lived closer to work? How many of you know, there are only a few more, know, or in your own mind, if you're a baby boomer, thinking of downsizing with the importance of a bedroom being on the first floor or living near amenities? And then how many of you think that the cost of housing in the Commonwealth is getting just too expensive? How can people afford it? And lastly, how many of you have ever lived in a house or an apartment? <laughs> okay, and that's what this program is about today. There's something in this program today for everyone to stay uh, keenly uh, interested in. We have subject matter experts on housing, on smart growth, and transportation. And we're also going to hear from the mayor of the city, uh, and I'll say he is the keynote speaker today, but we will hear from the mayor about some of the challenges and opportunities that he sees uh, in his administration and in his upcoming uh, years. So today's program is a, is a quite uh, beneficial program to each and every person here in the room. 
We also have packets on your table with uh, speakers' bios and some wonderful information in there about what we're talking about today. What I would like to do is introduce our ambassadors. We have Joanne Schneider, and hold your applause, please, from Eastern Bank. She'll be uh, our interviewer. John King, Richard Hook from Crescent Credit Union, Catherine Light from Mansfield Bank, Brenda Karens from Old Colony Elderly Service, Marie Epstein from Source 4, Marnie Dutton from Conorera Senior Living Camp Elder. We can have a round of applause for our ambassadors. <laughs> we also have with us today uh, some current board members, Jerry Nadeau, Pat Charamella, and a former board member, uh, Sue Joss. If uh, you could just raise your hand if we could give their name. I'd like to welcome if, uh, Joanne, if you could come up, and uh, Joanne Schneider from uh, Eastern Bank, along with our sponsor uh, today, we're calling the Elderly Services. If, uh, Nicole, you can come up as well. Nicole. Joanne is an ADP branch manager at Eastern Bank on Quincy Street in Brockton. And Joanne has serves as our chair of the ambassador committee where she served for some five years. Today's Good Morning Metro South is being sponsored by the Oak Colony Elderly Services, professionally known as OCES, and joining us is Nicole Long, uh, Chief Executive Officer. Please join us up here, and if you can navigate your way right over here, carefully. <laughs> Chamber members are familiar with the Old Colony Elder Services as providing supports and services to older adults 60 plus to support their ability to remain living independently in the community. Can you share a few things about OCOES that we may not be aware of? Well, to start, we serve people of all ages, not just 60 and older. Uh, we provide a variety of services, actually 19, over 19 different programs, and again, we touch people of all ages, including individuals with disabilities. Um, a lot of people think about the services we provide in the home, the home care services, but we actually provide a lot more than that. We provide housing support to help people remain in the home by accessing community. We work with a lot of the local housing authorities to help them understand and work with the aging needs in their sites. Um, and I also want to point out that we don't just serve people of low income. People often think of us as a welfare program or a subsidized program, but a lot of our programs are available to people of all income ranges. Um, some of our programs are just based on a donation only. So I really encourage people to think broadly about our agency and use OCES. Uh, we're trying to use less of the elder services in our name because we really do much more than to serve um, elders. Wow, that's great to know. Today we discuss various topics on regional concerns in our local community. As an organization leader, can you share with us trends or challenges you're seeing or affecting the population you serve? We're finding that the people that we're working with in the community, they have much more complex needs. People are living longer and they're living longer in their homes, which is a wonderful thing. But with that, their needs are changing. Um, and so our providers, our staff have been, uh, had to really adapt to that and be more flexible in how we're providing services and also partnering with different types of agencies. We all know that um, the issues around substance abuse, people getting incarcerated, um, adults, children with disabilities, because of all of those issues, we find that the older adults are providing more care as well as trying to care for themselves. We have an increase in grandparents who are raising grandchildren, and we definitely are seeing more working caregivers more than ever. One out of every six employees is in the caregiving situation. So the manner in which we are trying to provide information, education, and services has really had to adapt to the, the different schedules and needs of the community. 
It's been reported by U.S. Census Bureau that adults age 65 or older <laughs> is the fastest growing segment of population and will jump from 46 million in 2015 to 88 million in 2050. One can assume that with this growth, the number of caregivers will increase, which I'm sure will have an impact on the number of working caregivers. How is OCES being proactive to adapt this new normal? We're really trying to get information out into the community about our family caregiver support program. That's a free program that's available to caregivers of any age, caring for somebody who's 60 or older or caring for um, somebody that has an Alzheimer's or dementia diagnosis. It can also be somebody who's 55 and older who is a grandparent raising a grandchild. And to get that information out, we're really trying to reach uh, the employers in our community to let you all know that Old Colony has this program and that we can work with your employees to provide free, personalized, customized information to help that employee know what resources are applicable to their specific situation. There's so much available in our community that it, it can be very daunting, confusing, and tiresome to figure out what is right for me. And that's what Old Colony can do, whether it's our information and referral line or somebody in our family caregiver support program. We can hear your unique situation and give you the specific resources. It really is a huge benefit to employers because being an employer, we all know and we have caregivers in the workplace, they have to take time off. You know, I'm a caregiver. I've had to take time off because of the care. It drastic, drastically affects the productivity in our places of employment. So we can meet with your staff during a lunchtime break. We can offer free seminars. We're really flexible to whatever that individual's need is. So we encourage you all to um, take a, it's a smart business move to let us in to help your staff help their loved ones. And Nicole, do you have any suggestions on how people in this room can get involved and support OCES and our community? Help us get the word out, absolutely. Um, we are always uh, looking for donations and sponsorships. We have a lot of um, programs that we offer for free to the community, um, such as our Meals on Wheels, our nutrition program. We provide over 1,600 meals a day. Um, we're, so we're always looking for donations for that program, and we're actually having a 5K runner walk, which we would love to have walkers, runners come join us. Um, volunteerism. We have a volunteer center, and we're constantly trying to get people of all ages connected to volunteer opportunities. So not only do you have enjoyment in your employment, but you can also give back to your community um, and just help us get the word out. Well, thank you very much, and I think everyone in this room may have learned something new that your organization offers. And on behalf of Metro South Chamber, I'd like to thank you for sponsoring the event today. Thank you for the opportunity. And this is just a gift for y'all coming and doing the sponsorship. Thank you. Our next interview, uh, Joanne will continue the interview, is uh, we're pleased to have uh, the director of the STI program here, Patricia Ilsley, from the Southeastern Vocational Technical Institute. Southeastern Technical Institute, what makes STI unique as a post-secondary school and the programs at office? Sure can. Thank you for having me. Um, so the Technical Institute is part of Southeastern Regional Vocational School District, which has two schools. Take the mic's off. Let me try again. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Shut it off on me. Um, <laughs> So the vocational school district has two schools, the vocational high school 
and the Adult Post-Secondary Technical Institute, which is called Southeastern Technical Institute. Both schools have been here for more than 50 years, and um, the Technical Institute offers eight programs to, that are, um, so we have three medical programs, a med uh, practical nurse, medical assisting, and dental assisting. We have some trade programs, those are the day programs. At night, we have electricity, plumbing, HVAC, culinary arts, and cosmetology, and also an evening practical nurse program. So the programs, the tuitions are reasonable. We're, what makes us unique is that we're a public school. So tuition is reasonable, and um, we're right here in the Metro South area. And how does STI engage with the community? We have um, plenty of opportunities for our students to go out into the community. We, um, we participate in the Brockton Knocks Down Diabetes Walk, for example, but um, our students are out in doctor's offices, at the VA hospital, at um, life care, at other rehab facilities. Um, they have, and they're in local area residents as well, and um, sorry, restaurants as well. We also have advisory boards. So every program has a vocational advisory board that is made up of people from the actual field, from the industry. And they come in twice a year to talk to the school and talk to the teachers and the faculty and give, keep them up to date and kind of keep them on the cutting edge of what, the, um, what each field involves. Um, we also have um, a couple of times a year we go to career fairs at local high schools and um, we have our own open houses several times a year to just have prospective students and family come in and hear about the school. And finally, one of my favorite ways to um, involve the community is the Taste of STI. So on April the 9th, we're having our fourth annual Taste of STI right here. And um, we have about 20 local restaurants and you get to come in and try some food from the local restaurants as well as food from our adult culinary arts program and the high school culinary arts program. And this year, the Phantom Gourmet is coming. We're excited about that. Wow, that's very exciting. Who are the students and why do you think they choose the school? So our students are um, very diverse. You know, we, um, we have all ages from 18 to sometimes into their 60s, but most often into their 50s. Um, they are, they're male and female. They are married and single and divorced and they have children and they don't have children. And the majority of them are working as well as going to school full time. So our programs aren't um, like a, you know, in a college where you might have a class load of like 15 hours a week and expected to do stuff outside, our programs tend to have like 30, 20 to 30 hours a week of course load. But the end is that after a year they graduate and they can begin a career as a nurse or a medical assistant or an electrician. So um, they're very, um, intense programs, but they get people started right away um, in their field. Um, I think that they they look at the school, they, they consider coming here because they know somebody who came here, or they know about the high school, and they look at the website and they hear about the, the Technical Institute. I think that they decide to come here because I have an amazing staff that helps them through the process of enrolling and financial aid. We have great support from our school committee and our administration and they, they really believe in the importance of the Technical Institute for our adult learners. And what's new and upcoming for Southeastern? So we recently have approval for to run two new advanced manufacturing programs. One is precision machining and the other one is for metal fabrication and welding. You know the governor is uh, putting a lot of emphasis on bringing advanced manufacturing back to the Commonwealth. And so we've been working on developing those programs and we'll be enrolling in them soon. And one of my favorite programs is the dual enrollment program. So students from any one of our sending high schools. So the Re Southeastern Regional is involves the towns of um, Mansfield, Easton, Norton, Foxborough, Stoughton, Sharon, East Bridgewater, West Bridgewater, and the city of Brockton. Any student who's a senior in any one of those local high schools could adjust their schedule their senior year, go to their local high school for the first half of their senior year, come to Southeastern for their second half of their senior year for some courses, for some programs, 
graduate from high school in June, and as early as December, already be working in a career. And we reduce the tuition a great deal for them. So already reasonable tuition, but we reduce it, we, we waive the first semester tuition for them. So it's a great program for those students who get to the end of high school and realize that they don't want to make the commitment to college right away and that they want to look at other things first. Wow, what a great job that all of you do. I do know several um, students who have graduated mm -hmm. and gone on to have very successful careers. Mm -hmm. So thank you. I think that's true. I think they don't always, you know, the dental assistants often go on to hygiene school. The practical nurses do um, become RNs. They're, it's not always the training in the end. It's very often the starting place. Well, Patricia, I want to thank you for thank sponsoring you. this event. And on behalf of Metro South Chamber, is a gift. <laughs> Thank you, Joanne. Thank you, Patricia. It's always great hearing about all of the successes here in the Metro yeah. South region. Next is my uh, honor to introduce uh, our keynote speaker, uh, Mayor Bill Carpenter. Bill Carpenter is a 32-year resident of Brockton and the father of six children. Previous to becoming mayor, Bill served four years on the Brockton School Committee, where he was also co-founder of the Independence Academy, serving teenagers who are re-engaging their education while receiving treatment supports for substance abuse disorders. He's always been active in the community, the former radio voice of Brockton High School sports for more than 17 years. Not everybody knows it, but he's also been a former professional boxing ring announcer, announcing more than 100 nationally televised fight cards. And he's known nationally for this uh, effort in the past. Bill Carpenter has served for over five years and is presently in his third term while serving as mayor of the city of Brockton. His administration has established a new economic development team, which has developed a long-term vision for Brockton's future, a blueprint for Brockton and the Downtown Action Strategy. And the mayor has substantially increased investment in public safety and has created a 21st century crime fighting strategy and has also created new sources of revenue. Mayor Carpenter's revitalization efforts are attracting new investment and increased economic opportunity for the businesses and residents throughout the city he represents. Today, Mayor Carpenter's voice is heard nationally in June of 2018, the United Conference of Mayors ranked Mayor Carpenter as second most vocal mayor in the country on the subject of education. Fourth most vocal mayor on gun violence, and sixth most vocal mayor on tackling the opioid Mayor Carpenter is recognized statewide as a leader in fighting the opioid crisis and was the only mayor selected by Governor Baker to serve on the governor's opioid addiction working group. He has also received national recognition for his efforts to address the opioid crisis and has represented and presented and represented uh, the city in his efforts before the 2016 National League of Cities Conference, Harvard Medical School, and Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. Please help me in welcoming, uh, welcoming Mayor Carpenter. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Great to be here with you. Chris just told me my time is up, so <laughs> I spent all that time preparing. Uh, first, I'd like to thank the Chamber for the invitation to uh, spend a few minutes with you today. Um, I am thrilled to be here at Southeastern Regional Technical School in addition to the great workforce development uh, things that you heard about at the Technical Institute. Southeastern Regional Vote Tech 
uh, I've always looked at as being another Brockton school. Over 60% of the students here are Brockton residents, and uh, I am a huge supporter of the mission here. They do a great job, and at this school, students still graduate with an opportunity to go on to college, but they also graduate with a marketable job skill. And I think that is really the direction that education is going uh, in this country. And uh, I want to thank OCS for sponsoring. Uh, they're a favorite organization of mine. Uh, my dad is almost 92 years old, still lives on his own, and he would not be able to do it if not for the services he gets from OCS. So I very much appreciate what they do in the entire region. And I do want to be sure to mention I see Senator Mike Brady here, and I don't think he got a shout out earlier, so. Senator Mike Brady is here with us today. So in Brockton, we worked hard to market and promote Brockton as a 21st century city that is affordable, safe, transit-oriented, and a perfect place to raise a family or operate a business. We're investing heavily in economic development, crime fighting, our infrastructure and roads, and in educating our youth. And all of these investments are leading to a substantial change of the tide in Brockton. The conversation on residency in Brockton is changing. Today, people are choosing to live in Brockton. And this is big news for Brockton, as it suggests not only that we are a viable, affordable alternative to Boston and its neighboring communities, but that the city's perception is changing. We're rebranding and writing a new story, one that is attractive to first-time home buyers, families, and professionals looking for a place to locate. Findings from Brockton's recent participation in the Neighborhood Lift Program offered by Wells Fargo indicate a very positive trend. The Lift Program was a down payment assistance program where folks qualified for a grant for down payment assistance. It was offered statewide, or in five counties statewide. And of the five counties in Massachusetts in the program, more people bought homes in Brockton than in any other community, and by a wide margin in that program. Of the $6 million that was allocated statewide in that program, about one million of it was allocated in down payment assistance to families who chose to purchase homes in Brockton. And that million dollars of down payment assistance of those 47, I'm sorry, the 47 families, what was exciting for us is 36 of the 47 came from outside the city and moved into Brockton. And to think that of $6 million statewide, a million of that was funneled into purchasing homes in Brockton. And for the third consecutive year, Brockton has led metropolitan Boston housing market in the number of single family homes purchased. And clearly, affordability is a big factor in that. Uh, but it's not the only factor. It's our schools, it's our three hospitals, it's our public transportation, it's the easy access to Boston, it's uh, highway access, uh, that we are offering the things that home buyers are looking for at an affordable price. While this surge in single-family home purchases uh, is spiking up in Brockton, simultaneously in 2019, this year, you will see an unprecedented surge in the creation of market-rate rental properties in our downtown. In fact, 250 units of market-rate housing are already scheduled for construction in 2019 in the city of Brockton, right in our downtown business district. Just to share a quick story from this week as to how much interest we're garnering. Uh, Robert Jenkins is here with the Brockton Redevelopment Authority. They're a partner of the cities and particularly helping to get some of the long-term vacant properties downtown redeveloped. And 19 Main Street is one of those properties that the city directed to the DRA for redevelopment. And this week, three bona fide offers from three different developers competing for the same piece of commercial property in downtown Brockton. When was the last time you heard a story like that? We are actually in the position of having to review and select the best proposal because we have multiple 
uh, suitors for the property. Our downtown action strategy is uh, it's built around the mixed use model. That's what's worked in other cities like Brockton. It's reestablishing the business district on the ground floor, but developing housing above it. And with market rate housing providing customers with disposable income for the businesses that are coming back into the downtown. And right at the foundation of that strategy is transit-oriented development. We have not just in the downtown, we have three commuter rail stations in the city of Brockton. But in our downtown, it's transit-oriented development using smart growth housing zoning 40R to develop that housing. When our administration came in five years ago, there was an existing 40R district in the downtown, but since that time, we have tremendously expanded the size of that 40R district downtown. We've added a second 40R smart growth district. And as we develop the blueprint for Brock and the master planning process has been going on for a couple of years now, you will see our vision is for additional 40R smart growth districts around the other two commuter rail stations to foster redevelopment in those neighborhoods. And it's a key part of our strategy. This housing is attracting professionals who are looking to walk to the commuter rail station to commute to work. And transportation is one of our keys. And we're very well positioned because of the fact that we have our own regional transportation agency, the Brockton Area Transit, that directly links our public transit system into Boston. So not only are we marketing to people who want to live walking distance to the train station, but in fact, you can live almost anywhere in Brockton and take public transportation down to the hub right across the street from the commuter rail station and commute back and forth to Boston without the use of a car. We know that for the strategy to work, we have to have a walkable, livable downtown, a place where people want to live. And so one of the many things we've done to, to further that goal is we've adopted the Complete Streets program from the state. Because as we're redeveloping streets and infrastructure, we're creating walkable streets, multi streets that are for multiple modes of transportation. And as you see some of the work being done in the near future, and some of this has been done already in the downtown, you'll be seeing accessible sidewalks, bike lanes, uh, the infrastructure improvements we're making as part of this redevelopment include charging stations for electric vehicles because we know that's going to be a trend uh, in urban areas. So we are building with the infrastructure in mind the lifestyles of the folks that we're looking to attract to live in the downtown. We're supporting housing choice legislation along with the Smart Growth Alliance and the Mass Housing Partnership because we know for this to work, we need denser housing neighborhoods in the urban districts, and we need supports to rehab vacant properties. It's not just about new construction in a city like Brockton. It's about historical preservation and bringing back distressed properties, and that's taking place every day in our city. We're also working with Mass Inc. to support the Neighborhood Stabilization Act, because that will dramatically increase the amount of money uh, that's invested into the HDIP program. And HDIP is a, double the amount of money, HDIP is a, a, a state incentive program specifically for, for gateway cities to provide incentives to developers to develop market rate housing in gateway cities. And we need that type of program so that when we're working with developers, they can make their numbers work. And we need the support of that program. Brockton's revitalization is more than uh, just housing, though. It's also revitalization of our city's economy. Today, investors see value in Brockton's underpriced commercial property. We're a city, and one of few cities in this commonwealth that can say, that we have surplus water and sewer capacity. We can use that to attract all types of development, including commercial development. And I think perhaps the most exciting piece of news recently in that area is the fact that we have 
had established and approved four opportunity zones. Four. And, and that's a new program that is going to drive investment capital into those zones with substantial federal tax breaks for investors. And think about where we've got these opportunity zones. One is out near the 24 corridor, around the Good Sam Hospital, that area, because we see a future there built around a life sciences hub. Another zone covers the Brockton Fairgrounds, so that whatever the future development of the fairgrounds turns out to be, investors are going to have a great incentive to invest there. And our other two opportunity zones cover our downtown. And already, there are two new housing projects on the drawing board, mixed use projects, I should say, that are already working on creating, meeting the qualifications for an opportunity zone to qualify as a qualifying investment in an opportunity zone. You know, our, our healthcare industry sector, our food manufacturing and food distribution industry, they're thriving in Brockton today. You know, Brockton's a city of a, just about 100,000 folks. We have three full-scale hospitals in a city of 100,000. And we believe that with the strategic location, highway access, Boston, Providence, and those three hospitals, that there's an opportunity for Brockton to attract the life sciences industry. And we're currently working closely with the uh, MIT Grad School of Urban Studies, along with the Mass Life Sciences Center, in helping us do the research and to develop the strategies and to take the first steps to make that a reality. And the Chamber is a partner in this effort too. The Chamber recently commissioned a report that highlights the potential of an Exit 18 Life Sciences Hub in Brockton and the viability of it. I believe that the prosperity generated by the life sciences industry in Cambridge and Waltham can be shared with a gateway city like Brockton. So we are making historic progress on the revitalization of our downtown and successful economic development throughout the city. There's been an undeniable shift in how people perceive Brockton. We have spread a very positive and constructive message highlighting Brockton's unique attributes that appeal to first-time home buyers, that appeal to business owners, and that appeal to commercial investors. Because today in 2019, we are moving Brockton forward. Thank you. Uh, perhaps, 
or another young professional uh, who is looking to live in the uh, Metro South region. And then finally, an aging in place baby boomer. And how do we keep those people here in the Commonwealth or what do their housing needs look like in the future? So if we could start with Andre, and I'm, let me hand this to you. Uh, I know that uh, for those who have slides. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? I feel like I'm shouting over to the microphone. How's that? Is it on now? Testing? All right. Thank you. Uh, my name is Andre LaRue. I'm the executive director of the Massachusetts Smart Growth Alliance. Uh, we're a statewide coalition of organizations that includes housing groups, environmental organizations, planning and design associations, and public health groups. Uh, so we cover a lot of ground. But what we focus on is how we create and recreate our communities. And we do a lot of work at the state house, at the state level, particularly on, on issues like zoning reform, uh, housing production, uh, conservation of, of land, economic development of downtowns, uh, those kinds of things. I'm gonna set the stage, before I get to the scenarios, try to set the stage a little bit since I'm, I'm going uh, first. And uh, I just wanna say, talk a little bit very briefly about the kinds of demographic shifts and market shifts that we're seeing out there and how what that means for these scenarios in your communities how to deal with them so the mayor touched on on some of these things but for the first time the millennial generation has now outnumbered uh, the baby boomer generation I'm part of generation X which is like the Oreo generation sandwiched <laughs> in between them uh, my son's favorite cookies uh, but we are uh, struggling because there's a bit of a perfect storm uh, in the demographics and in the market. So whether you're uh, an older person who's looking to downsize or a younger professional who's moving out, looking for their first at home, uh, first job, and trying to become independent, uh, we're all looking for very similar kinds of communities to live in. And really what that is, is less space. Uh, the whole idea of the, the last 50 years where we built larger and larger homes on larger and larger lots, uh, that really died, that idea died with the Great Recession. Now people, for the most part, more people want uh, less to take care of. But they don't want a, a less of a quality of life, they want more amenities around them, which means those amenities could be provided in the housing uh, where they live, or it could be in the neighborhood uh, where they live, right? So the idea of having either a, maybe a cafe in the neighborhood that you can walk to, you could maybe work part-time uh, from there, or a co-working space. So we're seeing this not only this trend not only in the residential arena, but in the commercial arena too. Uh, offices all over the, the state and the country have been converting from you know, getting rid of the cubicles, getting rid of the, uh, the corner offices that are closed off, going more towards open spaces with shared amenities. So we're seeing this really all over the place. Um, and interestingly, it's not just the young, it's also uh, our boomers as well want these kinds of amenities don't want to take care of their big homes uh, anymore. So the problem is we haven't built enough of those communities over the last 50 years. We have vastly overbuilt the amount of single family housing uh, in our state, as in throughout the country. And we've developed lifestyles that are really force us to drive everywhere. And it's a diff particularly difficult transition period right now where we have these high housing prices, um, but we also need to transition to more walkable, vibrant neighborhoods and communities. And every community can do this. It's not just you know the Brockton's or the regional cities, uh, it's also the suburbs. Every community really needs to think about where in its community you can create a more walkable place where there's some things to, to, to do, right? 
our small businesses can't compete with online, with the big box stores. The only way that they can survive in today's market is by having enough foot traffic. You're not going to get that foot traffic unless you have housing uh, near them. You're not going to get that if you have too much parking in your downtowns. So parking management becomes very important. You have to consolidate the parking that you have. You can't have you know, five spaces in front of every small store. You have to have shared parking facilities and manage it. You have to maybe reduce parking minimums or go to uh, install parking maximums instead. So communities have to think about these things from a, a big picture, about what they're trying to accomplish at a higher level before you even get down to the, the, the project level or the scenario level that we're talking about here. And what does this mean in particular for the Metro South region? I was talking to Mayor Carpenter before this. You know, there's an interesting series of pressures and opportunities that the region has right now. So, like I said, people want to live in places like Brockton. They're, come, they're willing to come back to the downtowns. We haven't seen that in a generation or more. However, they want the amenities. They want the basic services that are so important, clean, safe streets. Uh, everybody wants this. This is not uh, you know, a, an issue of upper class versus middle class versus lower class. Everybody wants these things. And so we have a responsibility to all of our residents to provide them. Uh, at the same time, this region is receiving a lot of displaced folks from the Boston area. And so the opportunity is to, to try to take advantage of that, to be, you know, address the commuters that we have in, in one of those scenarios, but also provide the amenities for the people who have been living here all along. There is a, a market that can be developed, and there can be businesses and services for that market. We're trying to add. We're not, this isn't a zero-sum game. We're adding to what is here already. So let me go specifically to actions uh, that can be taken around these, these scenarios. So if we look at commuters, and I won't say too, too much about this because I think uh, the mayor has already talked about this quite a bit. Uh, really, the, the units that are being developed around the train station, this notion of TOD or transit-oriented development uh, is very important. How do you build that critical mass of people that are willing to leave their cars behind, at least for some of their trips, and uh, you know, walk around the neighborhood, not only to commute into Boston, but maybe they're also going to be willing to, to walk around the neighborhood. Uh, I mentioned the parking issue, which is so important to making these kinds of districts work. Uh, the foot traffic for businesses, the basic services uh, downtown. Uh, you may want to consider a business improvement districts, which are a way of get, bringing the private uh, and the nonprofit community into the, the management of a, of a neighborhood or a downtown. And those are things that you know, you look at a downtown, they might need different kinds of services than a residential neighborhood, right? But the mayor can't, you know, discriminate and, and have daily trash pickup in the downtown area when the, re you know, the residential neighborhoods are only getting it once a week. So how do you provide those extra services that are needed for the places that are getting that extra, um, you know, foot traffic and impact and they need the, the extra TLC? Uh, well, you could do that by, by having public-private partnerships or a, you know, a governance model for a district like a business improvement district. Uh, I think for the towns as well, thinking about their town centers, oftentimes that involves extending sewer to places that are currently on septic, being strategic about that. I know Easton has done some of this work, uh, and it's, it's possible to leverage development to get the infrastructure that you need in those key locations. So the second scenario around young professionals and families, uh, we need more single family homes as well. I said we've, we vastly overbuilt the large homes on the large lots, but we actually don't have a lot of, um, I was talking to somebody earlier, not affordable housing, but sensibly priced housing, right, at different price points uh, that young families could afford. So there's something that I would like to call pocket neighborhoods. And this is the idea that you, you take 
places that are maybe adjacent to commercial areas or busy roads and you retrofit them so that they're still single family neighborhoods but they have a higher level of density than maybe your typical zoning does. Maybe you have eight units to the acre, for example, and you can build these smaller homes uh, around a small common area. And you see this in some places. This is widely used, uh, becoming very popular in the Pacific Northwest uh, around you know, cottage type of, of developments. But there's some, some really interesting examples uh, that are starting to happen out there around this. But I'm not seeing communities be very strategic about looking at, at doing this and rezoning particular pockets for this to happen. Uh, you can unlock that. Also, uh, I think just peeling back some of the regulations, we get in our own way sometimes and we don't allow homeowners to solve their own problems. We should be getting, not every uh, solution to the housing crisis is gonna be a you know, 100 unit apartment complex. Uh, but we could do a lot more to solve the housing crisis if we allowed the single-family homeowners now to do more flexible things with those homes. That includes uh, allowing them, making it easy for them, figuring out financing for them to create accessory apartments in those homes. Uh, and also to maybe take a look at the regulations that you have locally. Are you prohibiting, say, two young families from moving into a single family home and sharing that? I've seen that before, but oftentimes it's, it's done kind of a, a little on the sly because uh, building regulations don't always allow unrelated people to live together. Uh, and then there's opportunities for tiny homes and manufactured housing, and you can reduce the cost of construction by building homes, uh, small homes, uh, inside facil indoor facilities and then locating them to places where there's a, uh, uh, you know, like a pocket neighborhood type of thing. So on the aging in place, there's, uh, the ARP has a certification for communities called age-friendly communities and it's really just takes a local vote to start that process, create a plan, it's a five-year implementation plan, and then on the housing side of things, you can do things like the accessory apartments that I mentioned, or uh, you know, stabilize homeowners that are dealing with rising uh, property values and property taxes uh, with uh, uh, property relief programs, uh, tax relief programs that exist in the state, and then each community can should make those easier and educate and outreach to their their senior homeowners to use those programs more. Thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. Good afternoon. I'm Susan Connolly. Um, I've left information on the back table if anybody uh, wants information about our agency, but we're one of the state's quasi-public agencies. One of the questions earlier that Ray did not ask you is, how many of you live in homes with empty bedrooms? Ah, there you are. Um, so we have a basic supply and demand problem in this state. And a lot of what's been talked about has, um, where, where we are right now is because of that supply and demand pro problem. And so what's happened over time is all 351 communities have made it more difficult uh, to build more reasonably sized housing, including um, uh, apartments, particularly apartments, and at some point when you don't allow the market, you don't allow demand, um, and you don't allow supply to answer demand, you have a problem. We've created that problem. The baby boomers have created that problem. The other thing we've done, the nerve of us, is we're living longer, and we're staying in our primary residences longer. So, did anyone see that Saturday Night Live skit a couple of weeks ago about the millennials versus the baby boomers? Yeah. Oh, you have to, yeah, wasn't that good? You have to look it up on YouTube because unfortunately, it feels really funny to a baby boomer. It feels way too real to millennials. How we have created a problem that now somehow we want millennials to figure out how to solve. Um, so, I want to just talk quickly about the three housing scenarios and how they're all similar. And I want you to think about not just the communities that you're working in, the community where you live, where you actually have a role as a resident to have impact on land use. 
and how land use is part of the infrastructure of economic health and prosperity. One thing, back to this first slide that I had, I just, I love this slide. This is a map from 1946, I think, or 48. This is when the state actually had a uh, state planning department where we thought about connecting job growth with demographic trends, with transportation, with education and job training, housing needs and production. Doesn't that sound crazy? Like, who does that? That's like, no, don't do that, state. So now what we've done is the structure, I know, just figure it out. The structure is broken. We've really, there are a lot of structural issues. People often talk about money. This is mostly not about money. This is about political will and structure. I'll say one of the structural things that struck me today is when Mayor Carpenter talked, when Mayor Carpenter was being introduced and he's in his third term, fifth year in your third term. So you have a, so you have a two year term. Right. That's a structural problem for a municipality. That is. <laughs> yeah. So a lot of the things, a lot of the problems that we have, we've created. And we have to take responsibility. I can say all this because I am the last year of the baby boomers. Um, so I will take some responsibility. I bought my house um, in Cambridge. It's actually a family house. I have a family member in the audience. Um, and this was a family house that uh, her husband and my husband's uh, mothers grew up in, their grandfather grew up in, and their great-grandfather bought at the turn of the last century from the builder. It's a 1,200 square foot, one bedroom house and a 5,000 square foot lot. We raised two kids there. We're fine with one bathroom. Like, you know, we just, we, the way we think about housing has to change. And we have to think about it also in a regional way. Um, because the other demographic that is happening, and this is a national trend, this is not just here, is what's happening in the job market. So we're thinking about elder service, well not just elder services, I'm sorry. Um, the services that um, the local service agency is providing regionally, we're thinking about uh, school regionally. We need to start thinking about housing regionally. We need to think about this in all different ways. Communities need to work together. I, go, I work in communities I, I'm in a different community three nights a week, pretty much, lately, doing direct technical assistance, trying on the ground level to get communities to change their approach to how they think about residential construction. And you know from your own communities how ugly those conversations are. And so, but at the same time, because all 351 uh, municipalities in the state of Massachusetts have all their own zoning, their own board, that's like unheard of. Nobody else in the country works that way. And you know, in Massachusetts, we think we're so progressive, we are so far behind. So, what happens when we're so far behind? We become a really expensive place to live, and we lose our best and brightest to other places where it's easier to build housing. There is a direct correlation to permanent permits issued and jobs created. And I, all this is on our website, um, but because all of you live in different communities that have different dynamics, we've also created a website called Data Town where you can look at all the demographics affecting your community. And so what I'm just gonna flip through this, this is all about Brockton, you can see it about your community on Data Town. Um, you can see how you can compare to the state. You can pull up two communities, compare yourself to another community. You can look at how many uh, permits were issued, what type of housing you're building. Uh, and all of this should inform local conversations so that people are no longer use, using things like, well, when I was your age, um, I just saved a lot more money and I was able to, you know, buy a house. That is no longer true. The buying power of the demographics between 24 and 40 has not changed since 1986. It has not changed. Yet, the real price of housing has gone up almost 300% for that same cohort of the state. So it does not work anymore. Again, our zoning, our land use policies have created this problem. So when we talk about the three categories we started with, those folks are, need housing that we call small A affordable. 
type of housing that we all lived in when we first started out um, to, to be independent young adults where we got a two bedroom apartment in Somerville for 600 bucks a month. Um, that, that was the norm. That was the norm. And because of zoning and land use, that's no longer the norm. So again, how do you look at things? The other thing I want to say is the state is doing things to entice communities. They are not going to lead it. This has to come, this political leadership has to come from local people like Mayor Carpenter. And you have to get out in front of this. And if you're a town meeting member, if you're uh, part of a housing partnership or your CPA committee, you need to get out in front and start leading a different conversation around land use and housing production. And I just want to mention the South Shore Chamber of Commerce. We've spent a lot of time with them. They've identified housing as an important infrastructure issue for economic health in their region. And they are now, they have a full-time person whose job is to track housing development and to get people who are chamber members to show up to meet public meetings and support those, those uh, pr uh, production products in public meetings. Because you know who shows up to public meetings. So I hope you'll think about that and look at your own community and think about what you can do, but also understand those three scenarios, that's a small A affordable issue. And that's not about money. It's about political will and changing the way that we use land. So thank you. I'm uh, Scott Hamway uh, with Massachusetts Department of Transportation. As you can see in my bio, if you looked at it, I work um, almost exclusively on transit issues and, and those most, most always uh, for the MBTA. Um, I'm not a Metro South region resident myself. I live in East Boston, but this is actually my, I'm happy to say this is my second trip out to the Metro South region this week. So I'm going to actually respond to these three scenarios by talking about some of my sort of travel experiences from this week or observations. So on Tuesday, I, I walked a couple blocks from my office to South Station, took a train out to downtown Brockton uh, to meet a friend for dinner. It was a really easy 30, 35 minute ride. I got off, went into the Bat Center, which is, which even though it's, I think, almost 20 years old now, very beautiful, well-maintained facility. And you've got about 10 or 11 uh, bus routes right out there waiting at a time with the arrival of the train to kind of take you off in different directions uh, in Brockton. And that's in addition to, all of the housing units that Mayor Carpenter talked about are either already in downtown or part of that, that future TOD development. So in some ways, that first scenario already works pretty well. Um, where, it, where it doesn't work are really areas where you know, my organization, Mass.T, uh, need to try to change the way we do things, right? So the, that train, if I missed it, the next one was 40 minutes away. The one after that might have been a half hour. And that was because I was traveling during the peak period. So I think that in order to for Brockton to attract even more of those folks that want to uh, live in a place like Brockton and still access opportunity in Boston, uh, there needs to be a little bit more uh, frequency of service both in peak periods and off peak periods. That's something that we're working, actually working with, with Ray Ledoux, who's a part of a, a committee we formed um, as part of a project I'm leading called the Rail Vision, where we're looking to sort of you know, reimagine the way we deliver commuter rail service. Um, and try to make sure we're getting the most out of that asset. It's an incredibly important asset um, to the to the MBTA and, and to this region where I think I counted on the map, but I think there's 13, we have 13 stations across three different lines uh, right in this region. So it's really a, an important opportunity there. And, and even with the current levels of frequency, the ridership is really booming at, at a place like Brockton. I think we've got 88% more customers riding out of Brockton today than we did uh, 2012, the last time we did a real comprehensive uh, check. Uh, the, the other two groups, I would agree with Susan, I think they're more uh, land use, housing um, challenges rather than transportation. Obviously coming to this meeting today, I, 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 um, I did take the T for part of the, the path, but it's not a location that's as easy to serve with transit, so there have to be other solutions for, for the large parts of, of the region that are gonna, that are gonna have, have land use uh, similar to here. Um, but I think that the key uh, in, as far as the role that transit can play, is we have to do it in areas where we can be competitive. And I think we know that uh, transit, and, and in this case we're talking bus service, are going to be more competitive in areas where we have certainly the right land use. Um, I think we also, you know, there, there are things we need to do to be, to be more competitive as transit providers. Um, I think BAT is, is a great example if you look at our regional transit authorities across the state. Um, I think 
rated system is, is one of the most efficient and, and, and rational uh, root networks that you're going to see. So he's, he, he has a system that is really designed to, to serve those corridors where bus service can be competitive. Um, I think there's also, and that's another exercise we're doing in Boston at the MBTA, is, is looking at our entire uh, route system and trying to see how we can potentially modify the bus network, which has looked the same for decades, uh, and try to make sure we're being we're, we're only really competing in quarters where the where the bus can be successful. There's other ways to be to be competitive too. One of them is um, changing the way we allocate space in our streets. We've done a lot for for, um, for bicycle accommodation. I heard about the complete streets uh, program the mayor mentioned earlier. But transit's kind of been left behind historically, even in places like Boston, where the volume of people on buses starts to get really high. Um, I think that's that's a political will issue. I think, and, and even in places where it makes sense, it can be difficult to take parking or take travel lanes from other vehicles. But that's clearly a way to to make transit more competitive if we're serious about it. And then, of course, uh, frequency. Even um, you know, I'm sure Ray would would want more frequent service on those on those well-designed routes he has. That's obviously that that's more of a funding issue. So I think there's there's a lot of different um, there's a lot of different um, ways we can try to make trips for someone who's living in Brockton and working across town in Brockton or someone who's aging in place here. There's a lot of different uh, things we have to do, but it's, I, I would argue, it's, it's primarily about housing and, and job locational decisions. And then once those are made, um, seeing the corridors where transit can be competitive and then make sure we're, we're designing our, our routes and we're funding them properly and we're, um, and we're, and we're backing up the rhetoric by prioritizing that service on the streets. So that would be my Summary of the three, uh, Ray. Thank you, Scott. For anyone taking notes, he said that the bus routes were rational. He didn't say I was rational. <laughs> so, now, now we're going to turn this over to the mayor. We're going to turn this over to the mayor. And, Mayor, you heard the three subject matter experts. I think some of them. Uh, all of them clearly listen to your keynote remarks. If you can dovetail you know, the subject matter experts and talk about what you think can happen over the next you know, several years of your energies and your efforts, and what can you take away from that, and what do you think you might be able to put in place? And not some of them, but did you learn anything new from any of this? So I'll be, so I'll be really brief. Um, because I think I've pretty much already commented on most of these topics and we're getting past the hour. Uh, but I, I would like to follow up on a couple of things Scott said about transportation because part of what we're, we are really marketing in terms of downtown Brockton for market rate residents uh, is a 30 minute commuter rail ride to South Station. You get on the downtown Brockton commuter rail station Set your watch to it, it's exactly 30 minutes to South Station. So for those professionals, particularly working in the financial district part of the city, uh, there is no more affordable place to live that you can get to South Station in 30 minutes. And that's really, I think, a big part of, of what we're presenting uh, to, those, um, to those millennials and the professionals that uh, are looking for that urban type of living. Um, we do, I'll advocate, we have been advocating for a later night train. Um, I think that's close to happening, but we're one of only two rail lines, commuter rail lines, that does not have a train that comes out of Boston after 11 p.m. And I think that is a critical need for our uh, folks to, to bring those people we want to bring to live in downtown Brockton. They have to be able to go out for the evening in Boston and catch a train after 11 o'clock. Uh, to get back home, and it's, it really only requires even one train run right now after 11 p.m. So the trains more often would be great. I think the immediate critical need is a late night train. I think the last train we have now comes out at like 9.30 or something. If you go to the Red Sox game, you have to leave at about the fourth inning to, to make it home. So uh, we really need that train that leaves out of Boston after 11. And um, I think some of the other issues are just around zoning. And uh, we've made some zoning changes in Brockton, but we have to continue to make them uh, because we do need uh, denser housing in these uh, transit-oriented development districts around the train stations. 
Uh, I think the state has helped us make a major investment in parking downtown. So, you know, the new parking garage is under construction. We know we've got to go vertical with the parking downtown, not sprawl parking. And we're creating over 400 parking spaces that will be ready to use by the end of the year. And that's another piece of the, of the puzzle downtown. And uh, we do need to make it easier to have in-law apartments, which is not really so much of a Brockton issue. But in terms of families today, uh, we do have generations moving back in together again. I, I guess I fall in the aging baby boomer category. Um, I think I've been called worse. Uh, but, you know, the reality is, is that, you know, Children are taking over the parents' houses. The children are building additions to their houses so that mom or dad can come get some one-level living under the same roof with them and be nearby because that's going to allow them to not have to go live in a facility somewhere. So I, I really hope that not just Brockton but all communities will really have to go back and rethink the idea of accessory apartments and in-law apartments and making it easier for families to take care of their own parents there at their house. That's it. Mayor, I'm going to ask a follow-up question, Mayor. Um, I've had the benefit of going to Washington with you several times, and one of the questions that was not up on the three scenarios, we have older, you know, this region, not just Brockton, but throughout the region, has older housing stock. Uh, much of it is, you know, not very modern, older heating systems, lead, things of that nature. Can you talk about what you've done or what you see for the future in terms of making that older housing stock, not for, we had up there, the young professional, the person going to Boston, or the aging baby boomer, to allow people to live in their homes, perhaps more safely, or in a more modern environment, and then maybe, if anybody else has an idea. So I, I think it's not a new strategy. Uh, it's, it's, it's something that's been done for generations probably now, but one thing Brockton does offer is two family homes and three family homes. And that's how a lot of families bought their first home. They bought a two or three family, lived in the first floor apartment, rented out the apartment upstairs, and with the rental income, they could make the payments. Uh, I believe that still works today. Um, one of the challenges, and, and we were able to bring some money back from Washington last year from Housing and Urban Development, one of the challenges is that when a family buys one of these homes, they quite often have to be brought into compliance for lead paint. And that the cost of the lead paint remediation can be what breaks the whole deal, particularly for first-time home buyers. So, you know, we're very fortunate now that uh, we received about three million dollars in lead paint assistance money. We've got through the BRA about a million dollars a year. Most of it available by grants. Some of it available by low-interest loan uh, to contractors and developers. And now I think we can really work with particularly that first-time home buyer that wants to take advantage of being able to own their own two or three family house, but have an affordable way to get the money to take care of the lead, and then they'll make the rest of the deal work. And, and uh, that's that's been a key for us, and I appreciate you bringing that up, Brett. And can I add one thing to that? Um, so again, there's like a regulatory issue on this as well, and Mass Inc. has, um, uh, through the Gateway City um, uh, Coalition, has uh, filed legislation that's dealing with this issue because the other thing that happens is when people buy older homes and invest money if they go over if the value that they invest is greater than 25 percent of the value of the property they trigger current code and a lot of the none of these houses comply with current code and so that becomes a real problem so there is legislation to try to fix that um, and to give some breathing room. So again, it's it's not just the money, it's the regulations as well. Right, I know there's some, some efforts to try to look at building code issues and renovations, right? And sometimes it's harder to do the, uh, uh, the renovations that are necessary with the sprinkler systems and everything else and maybe try to streamline some of that stuff. What I was gonna say though is that the governor has, a, has proposed a, uh, a transfer tax uh, that would generate funding for climate infrastructure projects. And that, uh, that money, which is very necessary to protect coastal communities in particular, we think a piece of that could be used for exactly this issue so that inland communities like Brockton and others that have old housing stock can renovate those, uh, those homes to become more energy efficient and climate 
friendly for the future because it's really our, our low income homeowners and properties that are they're going to have the hardest time adapting to a lot of the, the transformations that we're going to need to do as a society over the next 10 years. Thank you, Andre. If I could um, just uh, ask for a round of applause for our panel.